That was amazing. Let's pray together and we'll begin our time in the Word. Father God, thank you so much uh, for the gift that is music, for the opportunity that we've had this morning uh, to sing, to play, and to listen. God is a great gift that you've given us. And now, Lord, as we turn to the pages of your Word and open up to a very old, old, old piece of music composed by a king long ago, I pray that you would speak now. Because even though the music that accompanies this piece has long since passed away, and the man that wrote it has long since been gone, we know that it is your word, and it is alive, and it will change us. And so we listen now. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. There was a king a long time ago, and his name was Pyrrhus. His name was Pyrrhus. The reason why they called him Pyrrhus was because he, much like somebody else I know, had red hair. It's where we get the name Pyre from, funeral pyre, right? So like a pyre, fire. He had flaming red hair. That was one of the things that made him terrifying. Another thing that made him rather terrifying was that his entire top row of teeth were not separated. His top jaw was fused together. It was, it was, it was uh, they said it was, it was this, it just imposing to look at. And he was a warrior king, and he went up against a little city-state in the middle of the Italian peninsula known as Rome. And he managed to beat Rome a couple times. But he recognized, as his generals were congratulating him, that while he won some victories, he won some battles, he was probably going to lose the war because Rome could replace his, their losses. And unfortunately for Pyrrhus and his kingdom, they could not replace the losses that they had. They were exhausted. They were worn out. They were tired. We still use his name today to describe winning meaningless victories. We call it a Pyrrhic victory. A Pyrrhic victory might be when your football team maybe wins a game, a close game, but they lose their quarterback for the season due to an ACL injury. That's a Pyrrhic victory. They wind up making us feel more exhausted, more worn out than a loss perhaps even would. And I don't know where you're at today, I don't know how you feel today, but I know that many of us are tired, many of us are exhausted, many of us are worn out. Rodney even mentioned coming back from the mission trip this week that he was tired and sore, which I find interesting considering in none of those pictures did I see him working. So we'll have to just take his word for it. But many of us are tired. Going from taking kids places, maybe just getting out of bed on a dreary day like today. It's hard getting up. Maybe this will be your only time to rest this week is sitting here today. So let's talk today about being tired. And let's talk today about how our relationship with Jesus manages this tendency that we have, not just to be exhausted, but to drive ourselves to exhaustion, how we worship those who are exhausted. We're in Psalm 37, and while it's a longer psalm, we're only going to look at the first 11 verses, and I want us to look at the three hows, ask three questions, the three hows of exhaustion. And the first question is this. How did I get so exhausted? How do we get in this state that we're in of being so worn out? Look at verses one and two. This is a Psalm of David and it says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. This is an interesting uh, Psalm because it reads more like a proverb. As you get into it, it seems like somebody took a proverb or a group of proverbs and then set them to music. It's an interesting psalm that way. Uh, Psalm 36 is about trusting in the steadfast love of God. It is the theological grounding for Psalm 37. 36 tells you what God uh, uh, is like, what he's going to do. And then Psalm 37 tells you what it'll look like when you respond to that grace. The psalm is also what's called a chiasm. A chiasm is a structure where the first part and the last part agree with one another. The second part and the second to the last part agree with one another. And the most important part is the part in the middle. 
That's about verses 25 to 31. But I think for today, we're just going to be in the first 11 verses because I think they speak to our exhaustion. And what it does is it starts with a very simple idea. It tells you not to get so worked up about evildoers because they're not going to last. Don't get mad about evil. There's an important way this is communicated to us. It's through a Hebrew system called parallelism. If you look at verse 1, you see the first line says something. It says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. The first line makes a statement, and then the second line clarifies it. Makes it more clear for you. Helps you understand exactly what he's talking about. And I think it's interesting that our English translation uses the word fret. I looked at six different translations this week, whether they were like super old high church kind of KJV style or new NIV, all of them use the word fret. I don't get it. I don't use the word fret in my day-to-day language. I cannot remember the last time I said, oh, Hattie, it's okay, don't fret. We use things like worry, don't be anxious. The Hebrew word for fret means to burn, like Pyrrhus, to burn, to be angry. And there's different forms of Hebrew verbs. This one's called the hithpael. That's a mouthful. And the hithpael of this form is used here, and it's used in two other possible manuscripts. It's used in Jeremiah 12.5 and Jeremiah 22.15, and they're both used in a competitive sense. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, how can you hotly contend with a racehorse? Don't compete with a racehorse. You'll lose. The second one in 22, 15 is don't make a collection of cedar be your source of pride. Don't compare your collection of cedar to other people, other kings. The second idea is do not envious of wrongdoers. The psalmist David is telling you, don't look at what other people have and be jealous of it. Don't look at the way other people live their lives and be jealous of it. They're not going to last. It's not the way to a long-standing life. Don't look at the way they do something and want to do it their way. In fact, this is not just jealousy where you say, oh, I really want what they have. This is a jealousy that provokes you into action. This is a jealousy that makes you compete with them. Not only do I want what they have, I'm gonna outdo what they've done. And when you combine these ideas together, you get a very clear picture, I think, of why we're so stinking exhausted all the time. It's because we're competitive. We're competitive, we're a competitive people. We look at what our coworkers have and what our coworkers do, and we try to outshine them. We look at what our neighbors have, and what our neighbors do, and we think we need to do that too. And sometimes, yeah, it's the car and the house, but it crops up in other insidious ways too. I look at my neighbors, and I look at their lawn. I'm like, why is their lawn so green? And mine is brownish. I need to do something about that. I look at my neighbors, my neighbors behind me just put in a new fence. And I look at my fence, and guess what my fence is doing? Everything a fence is supposed to do, it's fine. But their fence is new, and I want their fence. We want to keep up with our friends. We see what our friends do. They're going on vacation. I feel like I need a vacation. I want a vacation. Friends get us a promotion. I want a promotion. Your friend starts to lose weight. Start losing weight too, right? I had a friend in seminary. He actually did mine and Kim's wedding. And by the time I knew him, uh, he and his wife had two kids and they were pregnant with their third. They got pregnant while we worked together at the UPS store. And I remember telling him one day, I said, Tice, you've got to slow down, man. I wasn't even married at that point. And I was like, you're like a quarterback throwing passes in the fourth quarter and you're already up 49 to nothing. I can't keep up, man. Slow down. Rather than congratulating him on the birth of his third child, I started thinking in a competitive sense. It happens in our families too. My wife is getting a PhD. I'm very proud of her. I'm also a little intimidated. I don't know why. 
She's the same person. But I start thinking to myself, should I be getting one? Should I do that? Rather than celebrating her, I think of my own insecurities. We have this board game that we play at my house. It's called Everdell. We love board games in my family. It's a game that Hattie likes to play. She's six. And you would think that when playing this board game, board games are supposed to be what? Fun. Not the way Travis plays them. I'm like Conan the Barbarian. I'm going to drive my enemies before me. Maybe me and Pyrrhus have more in common than just the red beard. I didn't have fun Friday night when we played that game because I wanted to win. We live in a sinful and broken world and one of the ways that sin and brokenness crops up in our lives, that bubbles up, is through the spirit of unrighteous competition. And it's one of the things that we applaud in our society and I think it's why we kind of ignore it. We want to be competitive. We want to compete. We want to strive. And what happens is when other people become successful, we don't celebrate them. My wife beat me in that board game on Friday. I didn't say, God, you played a great game, baby. Good job. I was provoked. It's like, next time. It's like, I would have have done better if I hadn't been, you know, trying to manage the other kid, you know, like finding excuses. I was provoked. We're provoked by other people's success. We don't rejoice when other people do well. We're provoked by it. We want to we want to do more. We want to we want to act. We exhaust ourselves. And what happens is along this journey of provocation, when it when it when we become competitive as individuals, it looks kind of funny, it looks kind of petty. But when you put it in a group of people, it starts looking different. It looks like racism. Racism is inherently competitive. We want stuff for people that look like us, and we're going to take it from people that don't look like us. That's what colonialism is. Same concept, same concept. Wars of conquest, the same way. I'm reading a book right now on the, the rise of the war between Germany and England uh, leading up to World War I and their, their naval race. And, and throughout the book, it talks about Germany wanting their place in the sun, which is funny because Germany was like the fifth largest empire at the time. They had plenty of space in the sun. But because there were four kingdoms ahead of them, they felt like they needed to climb the ladder. We're the same way. We rarely as a people spend a day in the shade and we claim that we need our place in the sun. The novelist Umberto Eco, and I love this quote, since I became a novelist, I have discovered that I am biased. Either I think a new novel is worse than mine and I don't like it, or I suspect it is better than my novels, and I don't like it. (laughs) This is why we're so tired. This is why you're so worn out. It's because every time something happens in your life, you have been groomed, conditioned, and trained both by the condition of your own heart and the society that you live in to evaluate whether or not it is a challenge. And you have been conditioned to rise to it. I must meet the challenge. I must keep competing. Every time that bell rings, I got to go out and keep fighting. We worship people who work themselves to death. We applaud them. Now, some of you might say, nah, I'm not that competitive. I don't, I don't work like that. That's, that's not in my heart, Travis. Well, let me ask you this. Has that always been the case? Or have you just climbed high enough on the ladder or high enough in the mountain? You've dealt with all your challengers. You don't feel competitive anymore because you've arrived. You don't feel the need to compete. Or maybe it's not that. Many of us compete with a vision of a person that we think we're supposed to be. We think we're supposed to graduate high school at 18, get married by 23, have kids at 25, Middle management by 30 or 35, partner by 40, let's retire at 55 or 60. When I was a kid, I used to love this video game called Mario Kart. They've got a bunch of them now, but back then it was Mario Kart 64. It was awesome. And to let you know uh, how lonely I was as a child, I wasn't that lonely. My mom and dad are going to watch this. I wasn't lonely. But I used to do this thing called time trials. 
And what you would do is you'd just race against the clock. You wouldn't race against anybody else. You'd race against the clock. And if you'd ever raced before that race, that course, they would drop in a translucent copy of the race that you did before. And you would race against yourself around the, the, the course again and again and again. Some of you, that's what you do. You're not racing against anybody but the ghost of a person you think you're supposed to be. Or you race against the ghost of the person that you think is super successful. So maybe you have a sibling. You've never quite lived up to them. And so you race against this image. We're competitive. And the scriptures tell us, don't fret, don't be envious, don't compete. And we ignore this passage of scripture. And we become tired and exhausted. Even the philosophers acknowledge that this kind of competition is bad for us. Freud talks about competition with yourself as being destructive. Karl Marx talks about competition between the, 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 class, the classes is the problem. We are exhausted from endless competition at work in our lives. Our strength is poured out again and again and again in struggles that may or may not matter. We are piling up Pyrrhic victories. We are winning battles. We are losing the war. Another wise man said... What does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? And that's what we're doing. And that's why we're so tired. Because what you're feeling, that exhaustion that you feel, is more than just fatigue. It's your soul slipping away. So how do we regain our strength? How do we come back to it? How do we focus to rebuild our strength? And then how do we leverage that? Well, first let's talk about how we recover our strength. Look at verse three. It's not going to be on the screen. It'll just be here on, on verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. This proverb that, that, that has been set to music. Again, I didn't read this anywhere. This is just something that I was thinking about, kind of pondering maybe this is what happened. Is I wonder if David knew some proverbs and he put them to music. You know how like to teach kids to do certain things, you might put them to music so they can memorize them? We do it a lot with like memorizing the books of the Bible, right? I still know the books of the Bible based on that song I learned in Sunday school long ago. I wonder if David had certain things that he wanted his kids to learn, maybe Solomon, and he put these things down to music for them. And notice what it says in verse three, it says to dwell in the land, to dwell in the land. This idea of dwelling in the land, it comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the law. God promised the land of the Canaanites to the Israelites. And they were to go in and they were to conquer it. And as long as they were faithful to God, God would let them stay in the land. He wouldn't drive them out like he drove out the Canaanites. Deuteronomy 12 tells them that they should not be like the Canaanites. And they'll have rest. They'll have peace. Resting in the land and dwelling there is a concept that runs throughout all of Scripture, even in Hebrews chapter 4. The author of Hebrews tells us that when we enter into God's eternal rest, we'll be able to rest in the land, the land that God gives us. And this tells us how we're supposed to recover our strength. We're supposed to rest. We're a people designed to rest. This isn't leisure. It's something else entirely. Rest is hard work. But the psalmist tells us how to do this. First, he says to trust in the Lord. In verse 3, it says to trust in the Lord. This is an essential first step. The Israelites were told every seventh day, you did no work. Okay, cool, we take a weekend off, fine, whatever. But they were also told every seventh year, you don't harvest anything, you don't plant anything. I know we're not an agrarian society here in Dallas, but go ask a farmer. Go ask some of the farmers that provide the food for our country. What would happen if they took a year off? Now go back to a place that regularly dealt with famine and plague, drought. Take a year off. That shows you trust the Lord. If you cannot set aside your work, if you can't set aside the competition, you don't trust the Lord. If you think you have to go 100% every single day, or if you're always thinking about work, or you're always thinking about that thing that you want to achieve, you're not resting. You don't trust Him. To rest is a statement of trust in God. Secondly, we need to do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. Doing good in the Old Testament is often a reference 
to helping someone who is poor or oppressed. And it makes sense how this would be something that replenishes our strength because it focuses our minds off of the competition of us getting ahead and instead helping those who aren't competitive. Have you ever seen those specials or, or seen those advertisements where like athletes are helping like peewee football players or little league baseball players master what they do? They go and help like at a youth camp or something like that. You've seen those things? Why do you think it's okay for like Dak Prescott to go help those kids? He doesn't have to worry about them ever taking his job. By the time they're old enough to take his job, Dak will probably be retired. Dak's not catching a plane to San Francisco or to Philadelphia and being like, hey, I've noticed the quarterback play on the Eagles or the 49ers is really struggling. I'm going to go over there and help them and then just come back. I've got some ideas that might fix their problems. No, it's because of competition. To help those who are not competitive is a good and righteous thing and it helps us to get our eyes off of the competition that we thrive on. keeps going and says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Reliability, sticking by your commitments is a great way of resting. And you might say, Travis, what do you mean? I've got way too many commitments. That's the reason why I can't rest. Maybe it's because when we stick to it or we make a commitment, we hold open the idea. We hold open the idea that maybe, just maybe, we'll cancel that plan. And so we overbook ourselves. My generation and the generation that comes after me, Generation Z, we have a tendency to not commit to plans, to be non-committal so that we can wait and see if something else comes up. So we have all these little things floating around. Maybe I'll do this, maybe I won't do this, but nothing's set in stone. Let me encourage you, all of you, make a commitment. Stick to it. If you're in a marriage and you're wondering whether I should get out of that marriage, Make a commitment, stick to it, stick to it, and you will find rest. It's the vacillating between will I, won't I, what am I gonna do? That's where we find ourselves being exhausted. But when you commit to something, you're able to plant yourself like a tree and rest. Verse five keeps, sorry, verse four. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is a comparative verse. The wicked that will be cut off, they delight themselves in their possessions, in their winning the competition, in their accruing trophies. But not us, not those who follow Christ. The person who, they are supposed to delight in the Lord. And when you delight in the Lord, you get the desires of your heart. Now you might sit there and be like, Travis, is that the secret? If I just be happy in the Lord, he'll give me whatever I want? Well, yes and no. No, and that God is not in the business of giving us just whatever we want. That would make him a bad father. Good parents don't give their kids whatever they want. But secondly, what happens is God changes our hearts to match his own. He transforms us so that we might then desire the things that he wants. It's like growing up. And maybe you, as you grew up, you resisted your parents and you resisted their leadership in your life. But then you reached a certain age and you're like, hmm, mom and dad weren't so foolish after all. Your heart was changed. This is why rest is so critical. Let me ask you this. Where do you think transformation happens? Do you think transformation happens when you're going 90 to nothing, a meeting to another meeting to another meeting, to an appointment, to home? Where do you think that happens? Where do you think God transforms us? Do you think he transforms you in the middle of meetings that you have? Do you think he transforms you while you're listening uh, to yet another podcast? Do you think he transforms you while you're taking the kids to practice, do you think he transforms you while you're out with your friends? Or do you think that God transforms you in those quiet, still moments when we rest? Where do you think transformation takes place? It takes place when we rest, when we consider all the things that God is doing. Romans 12, 2 says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. This renewal takes place by resting and delighting in the Lord. Delight is not frenetic. If you were to describe a couple that were delighting in each other, how would you describe them? The image that I get in my head is like a couple that's at dinner and they're just kind of staring into each other's eyes and kind of lovingly encouraging or maybe touching each other, but they're resting in each other. 
making the rest of the patrons at the restaurant disgusted, but they are very happy. They're delighting in one another. Next, it says to commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Resting in the Lord is something that we stick to regardless of the results that we get. When you go to the gym for the first time, you don't come home and all of a sudden you just drop 20 pounds. That would be nice, but that is not how it goes. You work out, you exercise, you pick up a new skill, and you fail, and you fail, and you fail, and then you stop failing as much, and then you start succeeding. Resting in the Lord is not something that usually yields immediate results, and it's why we give up on it so quickly. Verse 6 tells us to remember the goal. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Notice he's bringing forth our righteousness. He's bringing forth justice. Those are the goals of the Lord. Those are the things that he wants. And those are the things as his people we want too. Our goal is to be transformed. Our goal is to be made like Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's your goal in life. It's not to accrue the stuff. It's not to climb the ladder. It's not to be at the picture-perfect family. The goal is to become more like Christ. And sometimes that stuff gets added along the way. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. And what? All these things will be added unto you. Lastly, don't get so mad. Verses 7 and 8. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. Over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Let me ask you this. When you're driving down the road and you're going speed limit-ish and somebody just like blasts by you, is there a part of you that's like, I'm going to get, I'm going to catch that guy. I'm going to follow that person. Oh, it's a race. It's on. Is there a part of you that hopes that person gets pulled over? (laughs) Or am I just the only one that has vengeance in my heart? I don't want anything bad to happen to him. I just want him to get a ticket. Look, we get worked up over so many things. And usually we get provoked when we feel like somebody who has something gains more. Because usually the person blowing by my Mazda CX-5 is usually driving a very much nicer car than me. Am I provoked by the speed of the person or am I provoked by the fact that they have a nicer car and they're breaking the law? Y'all, we got to chill out. we got to rest. You might say, Travis, isn't competition a good thing? Isn't ambition healthy? Isn't it good for me to do that? Shouldn't I use my strength to, to leverage towards competition? Am I just supposed to sit around? Did God give me gifts that I'm just supposed to sit around for? Well, no. Let's talk about this. How do I use my strength? Verse 9. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. I want to talk about two concepts here. One, it takes strength to rest. Resting is not, well, I'm so worn out, I'm just going to quit. That's exhaustion. Rest is when you have something else to give and you choose not to. Rest is when you stop intentionally choosing not to. You don't have to go max effort all the time. Now, the flip side of that is the, 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 it takes strength to rest. The flip side is you don't actually have the strength to do it. Because here's the thing. We love the competition. And my strength, my, the things I'm good at, I want to leverage towards my own benefit. I want to leverage towards my own glorification, my own grandeur. It's the sin that's inside of me. It, it, it's stirred up by this idea. And so when I have the opportunity to rest or to do something for myself, I'm going to take the thing that's for myself. I want to compete. I'm going to covet. I'm going to be jealous. 
I want to get what's mine. And sometimes it's not always blatantly selfish. Sometimes I'll try to justify it. Like, well, I'm going to climb the ladder and I'm going to make a bunch of money but, and I'm going to take that money that would normally go to some CEO that doesn't love the Lord and I'm going to give it to Jesus. Like a Robin Hood for God. Y'all, this is how sin works in our lives. We take things that are good things. Ambition, eh, good, bad, maybe. But being successful in a career, earning money, those aren't bad things, but what we do with it is we make it the core of our being and our identity and we can't rest anymore because when we rest, we stop feeling like ourselves because we made it the core of who we are. So where does the strength come from? Where the psalmist tells us, look at verse 11. David tells us the meek shall inherit the land. Here's the thing. I don't know that David ever took a strength finders test, but I don't think meek is near the top of his list. Now, yes, he started out as a man after God's own heart. That's one of the first things said about him, but it's never said again. David marries multiple women. He steals the wife of another. His hands are covered in the blood of other people, so much so that God won't let him build a temple for him. He acquires great wealth, numerous tributes. He gets angry. He threatens to kill one guy and his whole family because the guy wouldn't serve him and his troops. David is a lot of things, but he is not meek. So who's he talking about here? You see, David has a descendant, and he mimics his ancestor because this, ans- uh, this descendant of David says also, the meek will inherit the land. He says it in a speech that's called the Sermon on the Mount. This man does not have great wealth. In fact, he tells people he has no place to lay his head. He is labeled as gentle and lowly and humble, but not angry. His hands are covered in blood, yes, but they're not anybody else's. They're his own blood as he's led to a cross to pay for the, the sins of those who are over competitive. He's not married to multiple women. He's married to one bride, the people of God, the church, and he's exceptionally faithful to her. Jesus is the meek one. He is the one who inherits the land. He's the one who inherits all the promises of God. And here's the thing, for those of us who are constantly competing and striving, we're trying to earn our place before God, and Jesus says, stop it. You don't have to compete anymore. I've already got the inheritance, and here's what I'm going to do. If you trust me, if you put your faith in my life, in my death, in my burial and resurrection, guess what? I'll let you have the inheritance with me. We'll share it because Jesus isn't competing anymore. He's already won the victory. And so he doesn't have anything left to prove. So rather than competing with us, you know what he does? He invites us to be brothers and sisters with him, co-heirs with Christ. We don't have land left to conquer. So what do we do? What do we do with this strength then? If we have this inheritance now, what do we do with it? Well, if you don't have conquer, guess what you do? You cultivate. I mean, listen to a podcast now about, um, it's called The Fall of Civilization. And I was listening to one about the fall of the Assyrian Empire. And what the Assyrians' enemies would do is they would wait until it was harvest time. And they knew the Assyrian army would pack up and go home to harvest because you can't fight with a sword in one hand and harvest with a plow in another. In Isaiah 2.4, It's a prophecy about a coming kingdom. And it says this, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Look, God has blessed us with the opportunity to cultivate. You don't need a sword anymore. You need a plow. You need to cultivate the lives of other people. You need to help other people, serving other people. Once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you put down your sword and you pick up the plow. Use your strength to cultivate the kingdom of other people. If you don't see the fruit of the Spirit growing in the lives of other people, you set to work. If you don't see it in your office, you set to work. And you rest and you let the God of the harvest produce the crop. We're exhausted because we're competing. We're fighting battles that don't need to be won anymore. We're collecting Pyrrhic victories. And we're losing ourselves in the process. Rest. Trust the Lord. And cultivate the kingdom that he's giving us. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the rest that you have offered us in Christ. 
a deep rest. I pray that for those gathered here today and those watching online, Lord God, I pray that in your goodness, you would allow them a moment, maybe longer, to remember how much you love them, that they may rest in that, and that that moment may grow into a series of moments and they may have a discipline of resting in you. Come soon, Lord Jesus, that we find our eternal rest in you. It's in your name we pray.